that's our floor. That's right there. All right, 1.30. Um, so let's get started. I'm sure everyone wants to get on a lawnmower and start mowing uh, <laughs> because it's getting hairy out there. Um, thanks for coming uh, to the Drop Preparedness Workshop. Uh, I'm hoping some more people trickle in, but I wanted to get started. So basically the idea for today is for us to talk less than normal. So we'll see how good we do. Um, Gordon and I are going to give shorter presentations, maybe about 15 minutes each about uh, Gordon's going to look at vineyard floor management and cover crops and tillage and things like that. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about the grapevine and irrigation and water relations, of course. Um, the idea is not to provide any sort of do this, do that. The idea is to sort of inform everyone so that we can think a little bit more clearly as best as we can about how we might get through this year because i think we can all expect it's going to be an incredibly challenging year um and we just want to make sure that we have all the tools and all the information uh that we can uh, have to make the best informed decision so gordon uh, why don't you go ahead excellent thank you alec and thanks everyone for showing up um uh, to my mind, what I'm going to talk about are sort of the soils and cover crop things that are more of my home court than really the, the horticulture that um, Alec is involved in. And he and I have had several conversations over the past like 10 days on like, how we have this conversation. It is a tough situation that we are in. And there are not like good answers to any of what you do. It is a trade off of like lots of challenging um, pros and cons to decisions that, that we make. And to my mind, there is a fair amount of like, mm, personal judgment on risk taking, on how, how much betting do we want to do, that are we going to be like tremendously conservative and hedge bets and do the safest practices for the long term in our vineyard? Are we going to like keep our fingers crossed for some funny uh, shot of rain in June that helps us get through the year and we're going to be the only folks who have a fully producing vineyard when grapes are short and we're going to make really good money on those? And there are like pros and cons to that uh, risk dynamic you all are well equipped to understand where you are in that um, sort of short term versus long term uh, term approach. And so I, I wanted to just think through a couple of soil and cover crop things that are on my radar as considerations and trying to get us to sort of think on a similar page about consequences of doing things, knowing that there is like a dearth of good um, research that's been done here locally on on those topics. And so we've got a poll from elsewhere. Um, you all likely have some awareness of the like variation in soils across your blocks and your sites and to my mind that's a as we head into uh, a drought season thinking about the, like the range of conditions that you have in your blocks and what that means for you in terms of ease of management uh, this oh, see now it's not going so spot by a spot by the river big block of uh, vineyard um, Clearly, some like variation within that block in terms of like water capacity. This uh, image was uh, satellite image was taken, I think, in October of 2020, so towards the end of the season. And you can see that at least in the cover crop, there are like greener areas and uh, browner areas. Um, I know some folks, as they are laying out their vineyards, like spend quite a bit of money, get their good Cal uh, Californian consultant to come and dig a bunch of pits and like map the soils. To my mind, one of the outcomes that you would have of that expensive exercise is thinking about, do I really want to design one big block that runs across a lot of variation in soil um, when I've got good water holding capacity next to sandy, poor water holding capacity? What does that mean for both my standard management as well as management in a year when water is short? Um, I can make snarky comments about laying out blocks in terms of soil um, uh, soil texture as much as I want. It is not tremendously helpful as we're here in the beginning of May thinking about what do I do this year. Um, that said, if you like understand these patterns across your ranches, across your property, um, and you feel like water is, or and you know that water is short, you've got whatever st uh, stored supply that you have, you've got questions of how much money am I, go how many grapes will I sell at the end of the year? Um, 
am I going to be successful enough to afford all of my standard practices or am I going to cut down on a set of standard practices knowing that I, I may not have the revenue to pay for those come the end of the season. If I'm in those circumstances, I guess I wonder about do, am I going to spend more water, more time, more resources on my best soils than I am my worst. And so I. I get, the rows in this block run this direction. I do not know how they designed their irrigation system and if they're in a position to split up that block. But to my mind, you've got better water holding capacity here at this end and better water holding capacity there at that end. If I've got one pond full of water, if I've got one budget on, um, am I going to do all of my practices? Am I go only going to do 60% of my practices? Um, if I were hedging bets, I think I would spend more money on those better, deeper soils, soils with better water holding capacity rather than doing the same thing across the the whole farm knowing that I'm gonna have a big patch of of drought stress in the middle because of the nature of those soils um, but again maybe you'd say I'm going all in on the bet and I'm gonna farm the whole thing as hard as I can hope that everybody else struggles and I'm gonna be the one left with nice grapes at the end of the year that is a decision that is up to you. It is a, um, could put yourself in a, in a challenging situation doing that, but you could also have great rewards. And that's sort of one of the, the, the pieces of taking, uh, taking risks in, when, in challenging situations in like unpredictable circumstances. Um, and so then a little bit on a cover crop. Um, as my sort of experience, um, lots of folks have, have cover crop of one sort or the other uh, in between the rows of their, um, their vineyards. Um, let me stop blathering for a second and say for folks who are, are farming, uh, yes, cover crops generally in between the rows. Yeah. Um, anyone want to say like why you have a cover crop? We would go to vineyard systems in certain parts of the world or the country, head south to California, and I think you'd find more clean cultivated or sort of herbicide fallow in the, in the row middles. Like what are you after in terms of why you have a cover crop? Well, I'll, I'll speak to yeah. this. So we have a cover crop. Um, so there's a, a, a good surface for people to walk on. There's a lot less tractor work we have to use, so less carbon footprint. We think that it's in, in a regular year, it doesn't compete with the grapes at all for water. And it actually allows us to have better management control over the water we're putting on the grapes. Yeah, I think you hit on like a bunch of key points. Trafficability, like sort of ease of, of doing that. It's occasional mowing once you have that established rather than frequent passes of tillage. There are some there are soil benefits that you sort of allude to on uh, when you've got lots of roots that are uh, moving through that soil profile. When we get that heavy rain, that like random heavy rain in the winter, having those pores and channels for water to infiltrate, um, increase the chances that that infiltration will happen rather than water running off the off the soil surface, um, holds the soil together. Holds the, reduces erosion potential that like if you're going to have a frog strangler of a rainstorm, those things that are going to get picked up and wash are going to be the light fractions of the soil and that's the organic matter, the carbon, really the good stuff that you want in terms of holding, holding water in the uh, dry periods and supplying nutrients. So I guess I would say that like for many of us there are like real reasons that we choose to have cover crops and um, some of those reasons may be just because everyone does and you look to your neighbors on what am I supposed to do and everyone's got a strip of grass growing and so you do that. Um, and so just uh, like the briefest review on cover crops which you might have with, with water use and a drought year in mind. Um, I guess I think about three general classes of cover crops and those are self reseeding annuals. These are things like Blando Brome or Zorro Fescue. Uh, the Medics are a uh, self reseeding legume or um, uh, subterranean clover. Uh, they grow upon rainfall in, in the fall, in October, November, will green up, grow through the season. They, depending on which exactly you're looking at, have set seed or are just about to set seed now, will drop that seed to the ground, will turn brown and crunchy during the summer, and really will not do anything uh, through the growing season until that uh, moisture comes again in the fall. If you're in this circumstance, I guess I would say relatively little competition in the middle of the growing season among this dead crunchy brown mat of mulch you have and your growing grapevine. Mm, frost concerns in spring, early season water use, there's some nuance there, but midsummer you're not doing much competition uh, with this kind of um, uh, self-receding winter annual. 
we have the like, sort of commonly planted um, uh, winter annuals. I'm thinking about oats and peas and crimson clover and rye. They get planted in the winter, grow through the spring, can put on a heap of biomass um, come early in the year and usually get turned into the soil. I guess I see this as a practice in a young vineyard in this part of the world to sort of manage that competition. Um, and again, usually are not, they'll grow a heap of biomass. Um, would not want to leave that standing through the summer, would use some water, would contribute to some weediness issues. And then finally, and most commonly, slow machine. Oh, my good timing on my clicker is not working. Uh, most commonly, we've got, um, got perennials. These are like the fescues and the ryegrass. It's uh, species that might be in your like lawn. If you like let them have some water, they will use that water, green up, and grow. And we'll try to do that throughout the year. When they really dry down in the middle of the summer, will sort of hang out and be dormant, but would like to grow if they can get their roots onto a little bit of water and would like to grow year round. Um, see a fair amount of this, or probably see the most of these two, and do have some concern that like, there is the potential that if these are accessing, uh, accessing water at the same time that my grapevine is, um, expect that there could be some competition there. And what does that mean when I'm in a year that I really am short or marginal on water? Do we do something about this perennial cover crop to try to uh, reduce its presence or competition, uh, competition with our vine? That, um, and so I'm gonna just talk in a little bit about that. Don't have good answers, but wanna sort of get us to a 2.0 level of thinking. Um, some work that was done in, my machine's still slow. So, <laughs> yep, uh, some work that was done at the Stellenbosch University in like the Western Cape of South Africa. Uh, look at some vineyards with four different uh, ground management treatments, cut some like pits in the ground and go and like get someone to count all the roots and the locations. Let me guide you through this because it's both small and hand drawn here. Um, so uh, at, at the middle of each of these charts is zero. That's like the location of the vine is, is landing there. And so we're going laterally away from the vine up to a meter away and a meter away from again the vine that's in the middle and then going down in depth to a meter deep and like where are the roots under straw mulch, herbicide, clean cultivation and a permanent sward of perennial grass. Um, and they looked at this I believe after five years of implementation of these treatments and so the plants have had a chance to like exhibit their plasticity of like can root, grow roots where they want to grow roots um, in response to these treatments. It wasn't an abrupt change that we're seeing but this is the sort of steady state pattern. And I think I mostly want to focus on these uh, bottom two, the clean cultivation and this permanent sward of grass. Um, in the clean cultivated system, they were like running their tiller down to eight inches or about um, 20 centimeters. And so it makes sense that they're, again, just like one step behind on my great timing on my clicker. And so then, um, and so then, um, since you're cultivating down to, to eight inches, uh, it makes sense that there are not that many uh, grapevine roots in that top uh, 20 centimeters, top eight inches. You're like chopping them up a couple times a year. They will not grow there. They will be in a deeper profile. Fair enough. Uh, permanent cover crop. Um, there's not very much permanent cover crop right on the plant itself, but as you get out into those row middles, that's where the grass is growing and the roots are underneath that, underneath that grass. And so when there are roots out in the row middles, we will not have grapevine roots there. There's cover crop roots are growing in those places. The grapevines grow elsewhere. Um, there are limited resources, both water and nutrients, and the same roots will not like be in just exactly the same place competing for those. Um, there's like some ecological reason to believe that grapevines are like sort of a interesting or valuable addition to a like other woody ecosystem as you're on like the edge of the forest because they're able to be kind of plastic like this and will put my roots where my grapevine roots in a place where other roots are not growing and can be responsive to available resources and sort of niches to utilize. So um, this sort of makes sense to me that we're cultivating away um, roots at the top, that there's competition from existing cover crop roots as you get out into those row middles. In the herbicide or straw examples, you've got like comfortable, happy growing conditions all the way up to the soil surface and roots grow all the way up to the soil surface. And so I guess my question is, when, what exactly happens to, if we want to go in and say, I'm in a drought year 
and I want to absolutely alleviate all the potential competition for moisture, one practice that like is in, is in the book is go and kill your permanent sward one way or the other because it's going to, uh, allevi it's going to alleviate competition. And I guess my question is, uh, yes, at like 101 level that makes sense. Does it make sense all the way to 201 level? And just want to sort of think that through. I don't have a tremendously satisfactory answer. Computer, action. Um, all right, so here I've like drawn my diagrams. I don't know if you can see these. I like my silly cartoons. I have a uh, one alleyway that has a uh, perennial cover crop. That perennial cover crop has roots, depending on the species and how intensively it, it's mown, will have roots that go down a foot or up to two feet. Um, Grapevine roots are not going to grow in the same place. Limited resources, the grapevines will find a different spot to grow. Um, data that we find, and this is after like many years of these things sort of growing up um, in a agroecosystem together, the grapevine will tend to grow slightly deeper roots and uh, narrower roots when there is that perennial, perennial sward growing in the middle. You say, cool, fair enough. If we come over here to clean cultivation. Uh, you say narrower roots. Um, a, um, if there was nothing in, in, the, um, in the alleyway, the grapevine would reach out into that alleyway and grow roots. But the roots don't go down that deep. It goes for the cover crops. So underneath those roots, wouldn't it reach out? Um, and to, to, a, to, a, to a degree, they do. That um, um, as we look at some data on these kind of experiments, you find that uh, in this circumstance, it almost does look like this, where you've got pretty narrow roots up here, and then as you get down below, they widen to some degree to fill that empty space underneath. But now we're talking about three feet underground, and, um, and so, but generally, the, there is less spreading when there is that other plant right next door, and that sort of lateral, line. so maybe narrower is not the right term. But so I contrast this with, with what I've drawn here. When there is no cover crop there, be it clean cultivation, where again, you're removing roots from that soil surface, or repeated herbicide application, the roots will grow really wide. Um, can grow like a meter or two uh, wide laterally. And we'll do that if there are resources there, moisture and nutrients. If there's a plant already growing there, like a cover crop, we'll not do that. And so my question is, we are at the beginning of a droughty year, or it's January, or it's May, and we say, I want to uh, alleviate this competition. There is some, like right in this zone, those roots are both after that same, same unit of water. So I'm going to remove the cover crop. Um, it is now removed. Um, great. <laughs> um, that was easy. Um, and so my question is, now that we've removed this cover crop, are we actually going to get these roots that have been sort of pruned themselves right into their space? Are they all going to get all the way out to the middle of this in the course of a single season to use that moisture? I guess I don't have like the greatest um, evaluation on like root growth, certainly in moist soil if it gets done in the winter or the fall before, expect more root growth than you do it on May 1st because you just realized we're in a drought, soil is already dried down. I don't really expect that, that these grapevine roots run all the way out into that void and use all of the moisture that is there. I guess I would sort of predict that through the season, you'd be left with this sort of like oval of a moist area where there just now are no roots. And has that accomplished your, your goal, both for your cover crop and managing your vineyard through, through drought? I've only been able to find one, one paper on the, we've been growing a consistent perennial cover crop, and then one year we decided to till it in. Usually it's since the, this vineyard was planted, it's had a cover crop, and since this vineyard was planted, it's had no cover crop, and we'll track them over time. But this abrupt change within one season, uh, in that one paper, they found that um, there was an increase in vigor from removing that cover crop, but concluded that was more related to churning in that organic matter and releasing nitrogen than it was actually about alleviating moisture stress. That was like one paper in one site in Portugal over the course of two years. Do I believe that that is the case in every, in every location, every vineyard or in the Rogue Valley? No, a lot of what we see in terms of the responses of these like sort of multiple plants together with moisture, with soil is really pretty like dependent on how close to the line are you on just enough moisture and just enough soil volume versus plenty wet versus plenty dry. You can really see a different different kind of response in a different um, 
in a different uh, experiment. Excuse, the, excuse yeah. A different way to look at that is when you had the cover crop there, the roots went down, the roots of the vine went down more deeply. Mm -hmm. Now you're going to have a strata of water up and down. Aren't you going to be better off with deeper roots to, to tap some of the water that's not going to evaporate? Because it's, it's too deep in the soil to, uh, to percolate up. And, and um, I think that that is, that is the right kind of question, and that in some of these, it's in some of the data, they say that having that cover crop there, you sacrifice some width of root growth in exchange for some depth, and sometimes don't actually see that differential, a water status in the one plant versus the other. Um, and so I, I, right, I think is, is, a, is a fair question, and I don't have the like, yes, always this, or yes, never that. Yeah, Michael. Yeah, so the way I think about it is that if you have a cover crop and it's growing all through the spring, you're having evapotranspiration. It's pulling water out of the ground. Yep. And through, if you get a drier area in the middle, um, you don't get the benefit of capillary action pulling the water out. Right? Water will go to a dry spot. So don't you think water's sort of more migrating when you are eliminating that cover crop and keeping that middle dense? It is so, de that is so dependent on the structure of the, of the soil and the texture of the soil on how much lateral movement you're actually going to see. Um, I guess I do not expect feet of lateral movement in a soil that is not saturated. I expect centimeters or inches of lateral lateral movement um, it does it really depends on like how strong that gradient is from like demanding water to through this lateral profile but also has a lot to do with um, how like, healthy or well aggregated your soil is that you want soil that has lots of pore space that has channels where roots have grown that earthworms have moved that um, the natural like glues that are involved in soil aggregate formation have done their work and are holding together like particles of soil that mean that you do not have and really do not want to have a like smooth and even uh, area that you can that is the straw that you can suck on on one side and pull laterally that it's all fissured and cracked up. Um, I think that's a, it's a good it's a good question and really is at the heart of trying to understand how do I make this decision on what I want to do is my understanding of my site or expectations that there is that lateral movement of of water. I guess that I sort of wonder and please someone correct me if I'm wrong, that as we are, we've got this herbicide strip that's directly underneath the vine and we're dripping water onto that. Um, yes, the grapevine is pulling up that water maybe just about as quickly as we're putting it down, but you're like wetting some ring of, ring of soil. We don't usually see a green up of cover crop around that and that we're at that same sort of margin of competition on, on that one resource of water between the grapevine root. Um, and so, like, yes, lateral movement of water, definitely. How much in every circumstance, I'm not willing to, willing to generalize. Yeah. For you, my internet, it's last summer when we dug up, we got your event, we uh -huh. dug up yeah. the, the dirt right next to the Yep. I wanted to go back to your question about would we expect there to be additional or new root growth after we cleared the cover? Uh-huh. Because we looked at some older plants and we looked at some newer plants that had been planted, I think, in March, if I recall. And I, know, I was surprised by two things. One is I was surprised when we put the dye mm -hmm. in the water, how it, where it went and where it didn't go. Yep. Both of those things surprised me. Yep. But it seemed that we were all a little bit surprised, or I was at least, about how much new root growth had been on these plants that had been planted in March. And here we were digging them up. Just a couple months later. Right. And I'm wondering if the age of the plant, of the vine, influences how fast the root growth would occur once you strip the. Cover I, I've, yes, I very much expect that it does. Um, that act, that a young, actively growing vine um, is putting on above ground biomass maybe somewhat more quickly than a than an old vine. Um, I'm remembering that situation and just that one root that we saw in that circumstance, and I and I remember us like Alec and I grumbling to each other on the, like, is that really a grapevine root? Could it have grown that fast in that in that circumstance? I, um. I think what happened was 
uh, there was a couple of participants that got super excited and like got in the hole and were like, look at that, look at this. And then Gordon and I sort of just, I just kind of looked. May not have been very well facilitated. Um. <laughs> Going, what's going on? Yeah. <laughs> I, I, everyone was so excited about the hole and the grapevine roots and all that, and they're pointing at roots and saying, look at that, look at this. And I kind of backed up, and I didn't want to interrupt everyone's happy fun times in the soil pit. And we were talking, like, I was like, I don't know if that's a grapevine root. Oh. Um, is, right. Is, so so I'm not saying that what you saw was not a grapevine root? Or no, no. I, would, I was just wondering, if in your experience, in your education and, and experimentation, if, if the age of the, the vine... Uh, we so we have property in Sonoma, and so we have um, more of that lagoon cover crop that we intentionally mm -hmm. put in there every other row. Yep. And we we have a water problem, and um, we are trying to figure out. Well, if we strip it all out, when's the right time to strip it out? Would we get right. any benefit of that? So I'll and just say that there there is a flush of growth in the spring, shoots and roots. In any age fine. Oh yeah, yep. I mean, you see the buds open, they start yeah. growing shoots, they're growing roots. Yep, same simultaneously, time. those will happen at the same yeah, time. They happen at the same time, and if <clears throat> there is wet soil, roots won't grow into dry soil. Number one, if there is wet soil there <clears throat> that and the water is not and the nutrients are not being extracted by other plants, they will grow into that. Um, so <laughs> it's kind of like what Gordon is saying is like, if you're going to terminate this permanent cover crop, number one, will they go feet into the middle? There's a question there. When do you turn? When you terminate that cover right. crop to sort of maximize the amount of time that, like, when that flush happens in the spring, will they go into that now wet soil that is now not being uh, de-wetted by the previously right. growing plant? <coughs> so let me just click through. I think one more one more slide here. So some options as I'm asking this question: Should we till it in, or should you have tilled it in four months ago? If you have not done that. You say, there's a possibility of business as usual. I like have a reason that I have a cover crop in the, in the ground, um, tilling it in, some of those reasons on that like nice habitat for soil organisms, those micropores that allow water to move through that soil profile. Once we start to rototill that, you have lost all of that. It will come back in years after we put that cover crop back. Um, it will not be there. Option, next option that crosses my mind, just like mow the heck out of it until it stops growing. Um, if we can remove the amount of leaf area, just like general plant water use rules, more leaves, more water use, if we can mow those down so that there's just a stubble, um, we'll use less water while the grapevine is putting on its above ground biomass, is growing roots into that space, we'll shift the dynamic towards um, uh, water allocated towards the vine. And then another option is, what if we just uh, sprayed ourselves a slightly wider herbicide strip? I guess I'm arguing that like maybe that grapevine root won't move laterally three feet in the course of a year, but I bet it would move laterally eight or ten inches um, without any trouble. And can we just give it a little bit more space by narrowing down our, um, our cover crop in the alley, maintaining some of those benefits that we have from the cover crop and the reason why it's there in the first place, and shift the balance a little bit back towards the uh, towards the grapevine and reducing that water stress. And so, no answers. That's the, the story I wanted to, or the conversation I wanted to inspire, because I'm like, I'm not giving you enough to say do this or that. Michael. Yeah, so I was going to say, just like anecdotally, we had some vines that were planted here, uh, here mm -hmm. in Craterview um, that were performing really, really poorly. And then we began clean cultivating the rows. And there was a huge improvement the first year we did it. And so we do that every year now. Mm -hmm. So the other thing I wanted to ask you about is that I've heard that where you have two different uh, soil uh, textures. So if you go and you clean cultivate, you get fluff on top. Mm -hmm. That helps preserve water below. Is there uh, any truth to that? Yes. Yes, there is truth to that. I was just looking at my 1962 um, general viticulture book here, um, citing a 1927 study from California on the like, um, well, so what really it is, and they have an example of like, you have two pots of soil that are buried in the ground on their little like weighing lysimeters. One is clean cultivated, you've removed any plant that is there. The other has like a single um, bindweed plant rooted into it and like let those go for a month. When you have a single bindweed plant in there, any kind of plant that has a root system, it drew out like four times more water by having that root system present than by it plucking all the weeds off the top of the other. So anything that we can do to, to like reduce this 
soil plant water continuum, these like the depth of these straws that are the roots of the plant that are getting pulled on by the atmosphere, we will draw less water out of the soil. Um, the notion that you either have like a crusty top of the soil versus a like fluffed up dust mulch on the top of the soil um, is a little bit less um, uh, clear the, the benefit one way or the other that like my soil physics textbook guy would say like no it doesn't matter if that has been fluffed up or if it is just sitting as a dense hard soil surface but what we do know is that removal of plants is going to remove the conduits for, for, for water to be lost from that system and so yes we can be sure that there is more water there I guess my question is can it then be utilized by McCash crop in a short turnaround time um, yeah. Also, you're telling in all the green stuff, which is you're giving a boost of nitrogen. Correct. Um, and so there are multiple things going on. So it's on. like, is it the more water? Is right. It we did it. We did that out yeah. here in our orchard last year. It was like, can can we replace this grass cover crop with some vetch, some legumes? And so tilled in half the rows of of cover crop and left the other half with their grass <clears> on them. <throat> tried to plant some some purple vetch, and it grew like about this much. And it was like, huh. It doesn't seem like it's going to do the trick just to have like a, a really mediocre establishment of this legume. But yet, when we go and measure the pears, the pears are larger in the place that we tilled and tried to plant this cover crop. When we measure nitrogen in the leaves of the plants, there's more nitrogen in the leaves of the plants where we planted this really mediocre um, uh, leguminous cover crop. And it's like, how could that have happened in the course of like a single, a single season? It had nothing to do with the, what we had planted. We chopped in a decade's worth of sod and all the roots and all the nutrients, chopped that up, it broke down over the course of a season, and that is what supplied more nitrogen to those plants. And it was not some alleviation of water stress or these tiny little shrimpy um, legumes that we planted that drove that response. And so we often have multiple things happening simultaneously and it can be a little bit tricky if you don't have... Um, I, you know, can to like sort of parse apart what, what exactly is driving the response that you see as you make those systems changes. All right, so that was 30 minutes instead of 15. Good. Luck, Good. Alec. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I just realized I didn't have information that I wanted to include, but, but I think I can just say things. You can hold up this old book at some point. Yes. <laughs> Does any of your, do any of your comments um, change when you consider a multi-year drought as opposed to addressing a one-year drought? I, uh, I would say that if it's a multi-year drought, and if you want to take it one step further and say, we can expect that this may now be the new normal, or that our the, f the climate in the valley is fundamentally changed. I don't want to get into water supply and the problems su surrounding all of that, uh, because we're all intimately familiar with that. But just saying, like, this is no longer the rogue valley of the... 1920s or the 1950s or the 1970s it's it's the new era or whatever you want to call it when we go there then you start to think about whole system changes in our production practices for example almost every single vineyard is on vsp trellising which is optimized for typically cool climate grape production which gets the foliage out of the way of the fruit exposes the fruit to a lot of solar radiation and improves disease management. It is not optimized for warmer climates. And in fact, there's a lot of other problems that you then you know, encounter when you use this type of system for warmer climates. You can think about cultivar selection in the same way. You know, everyone's doing cool climate cultivars, let's say for years, and then now all of a sudden it's like, man, we're picking Pinot Noir in August or something like that. And maybe this isn't this is not the best variety for this area. Of course, there's market forces and things that dictate that, but I, I don't know. You have and, and, and I guess that in terms of in cover crop land, I do think as we turn to the south and our increasingly dry, dry neighbor, we have less expectation than you would and really could maintain a persistent perennial cover crop when you have such like high evaporative demand relative to, um, relative to precipitation. Um, and I was really asking the question on, like, what do we do at this one moment in time? I do think that there's evidence when you have no other plants growing in, in the vineyard that, and water as rain or irrigation lands on the ground, it will be utilized by the grapevines if they have grown their roots in a pattern that allows them to utilize all of that water. And I guess I'm just suggesting that it takes multiple seasons rather than... Um, Your comment about lateral root growth. 
growth, though, over one, it's not a matter of one season, it's a matter Correct. of over... And so, and so if you've established your vineyard in that way and kept it clean from the duration, you will grow a mat of roots that are really close to the soil surface. When the rain does come, we'll utilize that and we'll like set aside the soil carbon and soil health concerns that are potentially like headed in another direction on what you do there. But it's sort of a goals and objectives kind of thing. Cool. Uh, can I borrow the laser pointer? You may borrow the laser pointer. I mean, the other thing is, if you ever, you know, you want to do some Googling about, like, vineyards, like, in Peru or whatever, where, or in, in much more arid climates, or, or even eastern Washington, you know, where they're basically, like, hydroponically farming grapes in a field, you know, they're getting, like, less than 10 inches of rain a year, it's a desert. And so the way that they farm everything is no other plants except grapevines. We were having a question this morning, we were talking about soil health, and it was kind of like, does soil health even matter? You know what I mean? To to the vines in your vineyard. In the world, it matters. Yeah. But like to the, just this one vine, if I'm going to do everything else to it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, that's a different <laughs> workshop. <laughs> Stay tuned. Uh, okay. So I'm going to talk a little bit about viticultural practices, but I'm, what I'm actually going to do is talk about grapevine responses and sort of some data about viticultural practices, and then the idea is that I'll finish early enough that we can sort of have a conversation. Um, so let's get to it. I did want to update people, uh, everyone's favorite teacup diagram. Um, this is from a couple days, is there a thingy? Oh, you can't see it. Uh, where's my stick? Can you hand me the stick? Yeah, this goes, yeah, this goes with the 1926 paper. Um, not great uh, situation, uh, we all know that. Um, I have been uh, trying to attend the irrigation district meetings. I saw Michael at TID yes yesterday yesterday morning. Uh, I went to MID last month. There's an MID meeting next week that I'll be going to. Um, good news is that we've had kind of a cool and wet spring and that the soils are, for the most part, of course varies where you are, soils are looking to be like at field capacity or pretty close to field capacity. This has been confirmed with some soil moisture measurements that we've made. Uh, obviously sites are different. Rainfall is highly variable throughout the valley, uh, as you know. I think any additional rainfall we get, as far as in a vineyard block, really won't do much if the soils are at field capacity, right? Like once they're full, they're full. So any rain that we get doesn't really help at the vineyard. What we're really hoping for if we do get something would be more water up top that's going to trickle down into the reservoirs and you know if it's cold enough some snow would be even better but you know it's may so like snow is not likely um the 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 other thing i want to point out that it does come with the rain even that does matter in the vineyard um is cooler temperatures and delayed uh, development which actually might be okay for us um and it's kind of slowing things down and and uh but we'll see and and so what i everyone Myself and everyone else, what we're interested in is when they're going to turn the water on and how long, you know, how, how long are they going to run the systems for. Um, it's looking like it's going to be an early June turn. Last year, TID was June 1st. Um, I, I think MID was right around the same time. Um, it's looking like it's probably going to be June 1st. I doubt it's going to be any earlier than that because they are really going to try and push it uh, longer. And the water supply situation this year is worse than it was last year, but the soil water situation this year is better than it was last year, so that's good. Um, so I think it's gonna be no earlier than June 1st that they're gonna start on. This is me, like Dr. Levin's, like a sort of assessment of what the board members talk about. I think that it's gonna be no earlier than June 1st, but it ain't gonna be July 1st, which would really be great for the grape growers and the pear growers. July 1st start would be awesome. Um, if I had to, if they are gonna push it later than June 1st, I really think it's gonna be first week, maybe June 2nd, into the second week of June, but I bet you if there's like a couple hot days forecast in the first week of June, they're gonna turn the system on. They're not gonna do any of the start stop business at TID. Um, so we do know that. Last year, if you remember, they turned it on for what, two and a half weeks and then shut it down and then turned it back on again and that was a disaster. Um, it's like logistically just, our systems are as old as my like parents now, I guess, and they're just not, they don't work uh, like that. 
Length of the season, um, TID said, what did they say yesterday, 30 days? 30, could be a few less if it gets hot. Yeah. So we're looking at about a month of water from TID. MID is in a little bit better situation. When I was at the board meeting a month ago, they said four to six weeks. That was a month ago. Um, so MID might be in a little bit better shape. Uh, they do have other sources, of course. Uh, Four Mile and Fish Lake, and uh, I think they get some agate water, but I'm not sure. That, that could be because they have streams and springs. So yeah. Doesn't mean a later season, just an earlier season. That's possible. It is possible, but I talking to Jack at MID, the manager, he was basically saying like, we're waiting for TID to see what's going to happen, uh, because they get most of their side for for this side of the valley from the Phoenix Canal, which is like out of Emigrant. Um, they're going to wait and see, but we'll see. I'm going to go to the meeting next week and sort of learn some more. So Rex on MID, so it affects us too. And we're, we've been talking for the last month about what experiments are we going to do, what experiments can we do, what do we have to keep alive, what do we don't have to worry about, that sort of thing. So, so I'm in the same boat. We're all in the same boat. Um, Alex, you may not know the answer to the question. But I don't. Anyway, we've been, we've been re really cool for the last however long. Yes. And we've had quite a lot of... Thank you. I feel pretty cool, too. Yeah, you're pretty cool. Uh, anyway... Uh, is there any word on the, the snow water equivalent? Because it would, would seem to be higher than last year by a significant amount, just because we haven't had that much melt. And what we do have in melt, because the soil is so saturated, is going to run off rather than sink it in the way we last year. Yeah, so I am hopeful for that, that last part you said, that whatever's left up there, as it, as it starts to melt off, that because the soils are, in theory, would be more saturated, that it is going to run off into the reservoirs and not soak into the ground. I don't remember, uh, Achala, do you remember anything from what Ryan said about the SWE? Yeah, I think what he said yesterday was, even though we got, you know, like snow and rain, probably it's not going to catch up the evidence that we would. Yeah, that we know, but, right. and the other, the other problem is, uh, a lot of the times when you see these snow water equivalent uh, maps of Oregon, they have these water basins and stuff, they group the Umpqua and the Rogue together, and the Umpqua on the road, Umpqua is probably in better shape, so that sort of shifts the average away from like, anyways. I just drove up there, it's, there's lots of water in the Umpqua. Yeah, we'll see. Um, just to look at the recent water years that we've had going back to 2017, I started at the end of 2016 and the winter of 1617 is shown here. The 30 year average from 1989 is the black line and this uh, day one is October 1st, okay? And day whatever, 365, is September 30th. The winter after I started was the wettest winter we've had in 30 years since, since the station got put in here, so that was cool. Uh, but ever since then, it's been a whole lot of not great. 2019 was the only year that was kind of normal, pretty much. Um, and then basically 2020, 2021, and now 2022 have just been sitting here below normal. So when you look at 2022, it's pretty close to the black line, but you have to take into consideration that it's following all these other really low years as well. So that sort of gives you an idea. But here's April. At the station, we recorded, oh, I want to say two and a half inches of rain in April, which is more, it's about double what we normally get in April, just to give you an idea of how much more rain we got in April this year. All right, grapevines. Uh, when you don't water them, they don't grow. Um, and, and actually, that could be good, and I'll talk about that in a second. So in the left figure, we're looking at shoot length over the course of the year. And um, these boxes just and the, the curves themselves just represent different irrigation treatments, from not very much water applied to a lot of water applied. And you can see that there's a really clear vegetative growth response. So the shoots don't grow as much if you don't water them as much. And then basically what it results is in lower pruning weight. Here we see lower pruning weight as a function of midday leaf water potential, which is just a measure of how stressed the plants are. So really stressed plants here on the left, really not stressed plants here on the right, and it's a linear response. So more water stress, less shoot growth, more water stress, less pruning weight, less overall vegetative growth on the whole plant. Why might that matter? Well, when the canopies are smaller, you have less pruning weight, you're gonna have less leaf area. Here, this figure sets up the next one. So leaf area here on the bottom, low to high, and shaded area of the canopy, low to high. And what the shaded area represents is literally the area of shade that the canopy casts on the ground at midday. You have more leaf area, 
shading out the sun, being a solar panel, what plants do, you're gonna have more shade on the ground. But why that matters is because the total leaf area that's creating that shade is intercepting solar radiation and transpiring water. And the grapevine water use here, shown in millimeters per vine per day, is a linear function of the shaded area. Canopy cover and some other crops, they call it. So all that is to say is when you have water stress, less shoot growth, you have a smaller canopy, you're intercepting less solar radiation, you're using less water. The reason it's important to think about that is because what we're going to talk about, hopefully, as I get, if I don't get too off track by the end of this, is maybe the idea to make it through this year is to grow smaller plants. And then you reduce the water use and you reduce the overall demand that that vine is going to require out of the less water that we have. And then you reduce the crop? 100%. Yeah. But it's not, it, they don't work in the same way. So I'll show that. I think I show that. God, I hope I do. And if not, I'll just tell you. Um, <laughs> Cultural practices to control canopy size and leaf area, shoot thinning and leaf removal, very common and it's like about to be time to start thinking about removing shoots. Um, this is, these are small letters that you probably can't see, but this was a study that was published in 2020 um, where they looked at different cultural practices and these are just data looking at different canopy architecture. Leaf area index, which is the leaf area per area of land that that grapevine occupies. So it's a unitless number. It's like, you know, meters squared of leaves per meter squared of, of surface area. Canopy porosity, leaf area, absolute leaf area, uh, and pruning mass. And we have untreated control vines where they did nothing to them. They just let them grow. No shoot thinning, no leaf removal. Leaf removal only, but no shoot thinning shoot thinning only but no leaf removal, and then leaf removal with shoot thinning. And as you can expect that the more, stu more green stuff you take off the plant, the less green stuff you're gonna have on the plant, right? <laughs> Science. Um, and, so, and so shoot removal is the easiest way to remove vegetative stuff from the plant. And it does two things. It not only gives you less leaf area, which would ultimately result in less water use, but it also removes the crop because every shoot has 1.8 clusters on it, give or take, depending on what cultivar you're growing. So you're accomplishing two things. Shoot thinning is just like pruning is sort of like a very gross crop load management technique. Shoot thinning is the next thing that you can do to control crop load. You remove a shoot, you're not only removing leaves, you're also removing a crop. Um, and so basically what we see with these treatments is that you see a 42% reduction in leaf area index, not surprising, an increase in canopy porosity, which could pro cause problems that I'll talk about in a second, um, and a decrease in leaf area and pruning weight. However, I have an asterisk here just to point out that they didn't see statistical differences uh, when they did all this canopy manipulation in the absolute amount of leaf area or the pruning mass. And can anyone guess why? Vegetative compensation. So they removed a lot of shoots, and so they had less shoots, but the shoots that were left grew bigger, right? Um, more laterals, more leaves. So it, it, the numbers are less, don't get me wrong. We have untreated vines here with 5.7 5 square meters of leaf uh, area, and the leaf removal plus shoot thinning was 4.1. So it's less, it just didn't, it wasn't as much and they didn't get the statistical results that they were hoping for just because you remove a lot of stuff, the shoots grow bigger. And this has been shown in the literature since I'm thinking of papers in the 70s showing this, that like pruning weight doesn't really change when you remove shoots and leaves because the shoots grow bigger and, and the, the mass of the, the pruning weight's lower too, one kilogram per vine versus 1.4, but again, the differences are smaller. Is that assuming no hedging? Uh, the, the laterals yeah. I get, but you know, like we, we're going to hedge everything. Totally, else. totally. And I, they, they were hedging. This is in Napa. So they were hedging. So then it was laterals that were pushing. Mostly, out. mostly. And, and, I, and I suspect that that's, um, yeah, it would be for pruning weight and for leaf area. Okay. Um, water stress will knock off leaves for you <laughs> if you don't want to spend money removing them. Uh, because you can expect maybe lower returns. So these were data that were actually tabulated in a paper that was the data, the paper was published in 2012, the data are almost 20 years old. Uh, and so let me just walk you through this. 
Uh, I've made all this sort of on a relative basis to hopefully make it easier to understand. We have two dates here, uh, June 12th and August 11th. And to give you an idea, this was Merlot in Madeira, California. Fruit set was on June 9th, so just before these data were collected. And Verasion was on the 23rd of July, so a couple weeks before this, okay? We're showing the ambient sunlight in the fruit zone. So we're measuring how much light is falling on the fruit, and it's just a percent of ambient. 100% is full sun. Um, and they had different irrigation treatments. So in this, in this study, what they were doing was they, had, they were crossing different leaf removal practices with different amounts of applied water. When they did the, they, and they removed leaves at fruit set or at verasion, or didn't remove leaves. And so they had three different irrigation treatments, which is why each of these lines has three dots, where they irrigated at 40, 80, and 120% of ET. Right, so just about right, way too much, probably not enough, right? In the control treatment where they didn't remove leaves, you still see a significantly higher amount of light in the fruit zone because the vines are stressed and they started to lose their basal leaves, okay? I will point out that 10% is where anthocyanins are maxed out in red cultivars. So you only need 10% of ambient light to fall on your fruit to, boot, to maximize your color. Anything more than 10%, all you're doing is heating up the fruit. So you can see just by applying way less water and, and it being in a very stressed situation, already at fruit set, you've got optimum light environment uh, at the cluster, uh, in the cluster zone. And look at the control, the blue line over here. Now, already here at the 80% uh, of ET, you're already above the maximum required threshold for, for anthocyanin uh, production, 10%. And so ignore the other stuff. Just by applying less water and inducing a little bit of water stress, or a lot of water stress, you're removing leaves. And so what that means is you may not need to spend money on sending people coming through to, thin, uh, to remove leaves if you're gonna expect a lot of water stress. In this case, they could control it. In our case, we may not be able to control it, but the point is, is that the leaves are gonna fall off if the vines are really stressed. And you can imagine if you have that severe stress after you've already removed the basal leaves, what are the next leaves that are gonna fall off? The ones above that. And now you may not have a whole lot of leaves left to even try and remotely finish the crop through uh, the season. Um, they have these other treatments that, you know, obviously, there's more sun on the fruit. Um, nobody wants this, but unfortunately, this can happen. Um, and so, from the same paper, they looked at cluster temperatures of shaded and sunlit leaves as a function of different applied water amounts. And obviously, the shaded leaf, the ambient temperature was here when they made the measurements, 94 degrees. And obviously, the fruit that was shaded uh, was cooler than the ambient and then the fruit that was sunlit was higher than the ambient. But again, in the controls here that were not very well watered, you know, this is a consequence. So it's an unfortunate consequence where, okay, yes, you know, the drought that you apply manually or environmentally where you cannot control it is gonna knock leaves off for you, but it's also gonna heat up the fruit most likely. And so it sort of begs the question like, uh, you know, that's like almost not marketable and unfortunately it could happen. Um, is there anything, so less leaves, more light, warmer fruit, is there anything that we can do to mitigate somehow uh, these high temperatures that we're going to expect on our uh, canopies here? How long have I been talking? Oh, geez. Um, Surround is a commonly used product in a lot of different crops. Uh, we don't use it a lot in grapes, but we can, and uh, a very, very brief Googling of some papers that I found shows that, you know, typically it decreases leaf temperature and cluster temperature. Uh, some of the times the data in the literature show that it reduces stomatal conductance or water loss. Most of the time it reduces photosynthesis, uh, uh, but yield is rarely reduced. Uh, and you do get some, sometimes the data show that you get an increase in color in the fruit. So I don't think that surround is like gonna solve all the problems, but it might mitigate some of the damage. Uh, and uh, I, I think that we, we might, uh, it could be a benefit. It 
Can I just yep. forget, if you're going to use it, you've got to use it with a stick or otherwise? Yeah, surfactant. Yeah. Yeah. The cuticle just, it'll just peel off. Yeah, non-ionic surfactant. Um, but it works. And it's like, man, I see it on so many crops. Mm -hmm. And in the vineyards, we just don't use it. I think we could. Alex, yeah. Uh, not to go off topic, but uh, do you think that would also have advantage on the smoke? Um, anecdotal information that I've gotten says no. That surround does not block any sort of volatile phenols from, uh, from wildfire smoke. Um, we are going to continue to look at that. Um, and shameless plug for some of the work that we're starting this year, or actually we started last year, is we're working with food scientists on campus to develop new novel products to spray on the fruit to block smoke. But that's sort of like in development. Okay, historical grape uh, water use. Uh, I've got this broken out in roast, by row spacing. Blue line is seven foot rows, orange line is eight foot rows, gray line is nine foot rows. Obviously the more rows in your vineyard, the more water use you can expect on a per acre basis. And so um, this goes from 1st of April to the end of, of October and just sort of the monthly totals of water use that we see at the end of the year, it's like 15 inches, 13 inches, and 10 inches. So a nine foot row spacing only uses 10 inches of water. This is a theoretical number based on a well, well, you don't have to laugh. It's just, it's just a well watered grapevine, something that like you're irrigating to match ET, you're hedging, you're managing the vine appropriately, but you're giving it the full replacement that it's using and the vine is never under any sort of water stress at all. This is how much they're using. Some of that is coming, this is not how much water we're applying. Some of this water is coming from the soil. Most of our vineyard soils here, two to six inches, of maybe two's kind of low, two to four, yeah. So, so if you, if you, you know, take two to four or three to six, depending on kind of what range you want to use off of these numbers, that's how much water you would need to apply to avoid water stress at all, at all, through the whole season. Now, we're not going to avoid water stress this season, unfortunately. And so if we consider that, you know, the water is going to get shut on here, or to, turned on here, um, you know, about a quarter inch to almost two, so any, anywhere from an inch and a half to two inches, we're looking at, let's say, two inches of water that the grapevines have used out of the soil, we actually might be able to get pretty far into June without applying any water before we can experience some water stress. And that, that matches what we've seen in our work here. Uh, obviously, it's vineyard to vineyard. Young vines with less developed root systems are going to experience stress more, uh, earlier. Uh, older vines with more developed root systems on heavier soils. We, you know, some of them we haven't had to irrigate until July. Now, going back to my diatribe about the water supply situation, it is very unfortunate that our situation is not, hey, we've only got 25% of the water we normally give you this year. You can take it and then put it somewhere and use it later. Unfortunately, our system is not like that. It's just like, here's the water, use it or lose it. And so unfortunately, we don't really have the way that our water supply system in the valley works is that you can't do that. So it's not like you can say like, hey man, I got mature vines on fertile soils that are deep and I don't need to turn the water on until July. And then you want to do it in July and they're like, yeah, there's no more water. Sorry about that. You know what I mean? Excuse me. So, so unfortunately we can't do that. Now I think we can probably figure out a way to work within that system. It's just unfortunate that that's the case. Uh, okay. This is uh, unpublished data uh, that I have from my PhD, unfortunately, but basically it matches what we see in a lot of other published work as well, is that we don't actually need to irrigate grapevines to match this. Jeez. Sorry. No, it's okay. Um, you don't need to irrigate grapevines at 100% of ET to maximize yield. In fact, yield is maximized somewhere between 65 and 80% of ET. And you can see this is relative yield as a function of applied water. As you increase the applied water amounts, yield goes up, and then it maxes out, and then it actually goes down. Does anyone know why it goes down? It's weighing the vegetative growth? Uh, yes, but the vegetative growth is shading out the buds, and then the buds are less fruitful. The following year. Yeah, the following year, yeah. yeah. And so that's basically kind of, and this is how we irrigate our grapevines, is basically right around 70, 75%, always. There's no need to apply a lot of water unless you're doing an experiment or if you're doing an experiment, or if you don't have any water. Um, this is other data from my PhD. 
uh, where we did an experiment literally where we applied a lot of water and then stopped at verasion or we applied no water and then started at verasion and then we had another treatment where we just did a little bit of water over the course of the whole season. So this lower curve is where uh, we didn't apply any water at all until verasion and the berries had a bad time. They didn't grow very much at all and then when we turned the water on at verasion they grew but they didn't catch up to the other ones. So all that yield potential was lost because it was lost or it was lost literally within the first like month here. And so that was this treatment. Uh, coincidentally these were also a little bit less mature at the end of the season too. The solid black line represents the berries that were uh, we gave them a lot of water 100 percent and then we cut it off at verasion right here. They still grew and now they got really stressed and they started to shrivel a little bit and they came back down to this other curve, which I'll describe in a second, but basically the yield was way higher than the other ones. Now the amount of water we put on was higher too. Again, the differences are made early. And the dotted line with the open circles, we had 50% of water applied all season long. That just goes to, sh and then what's interesting, and it sort of matches this figure where you don't need to apply a lot of water to maximize yield, you know, we reduced the water applications by half here before verasion, and the sizes of the berries weren't all that different, too. So, um, when you see this linear response of uh, vegetative growth to applied water, you don't really see a linear response for uh, berry growth. Berry growth will increase in size as you apply water, and then it kind of doesn't grow anymore. You can think about it the other way. If you pull back on the water, you're going to have less shoots and leaves, but you can pull back on the water a little bit, and you're not going to impact berry growth. When we look at ripening, as I said, you can't really tell much of a difference. You know, they all made it to 23, 24 bricks. The, uh, the stuff that was early stress and then with water late was a little bit lower maturity, but this is kind of like big averages here and, and the stuff that was, you know, a lot of water early and uh, you can see it pointed out here, a lot of water early got to a pretty high bricks and then it, um, not a not big difference. So that was really weird. Um, we saw a little bit slower ripening rate when we had the early stress followed by water application and a little bit faster ripening rate when we had a lot of water early and then stress late. And so, you know, timing of the stress is very important. So in the current season, if you have water stress early, if it's really early, you can reduce set. After that, if you have water stress, you can reduce berry size, which will give you less yield at the end. But also, the following season, what we found was that if you have water stress between set and verasion, a lot of water stress, you can have less clusters per vine the following year. Grapevines have a two-year reproductive cycle. So that's, that's kind of an answer a little bit your question, Maureen, about multi-year effects. Um, this is just kind of a summary, managing water deficits from pre verasion bud break to berry set, you should avoid them. Once you have berry set, you can actually be okay with having some slight water stress uh, with minimal impacts on yield. Um, and then post verasion you know, water to get, you know, to maintain the canopy. But we're not going to have this option this year, I don't think so. And as far as irrigation strategies, this is where we can have a conversation here. Here's some that I just laid out. I gave the same ones to the paragraphs yesterday. Wait as long as possible until you start irrigating, then deficit irrigate, and then when the system's about to get shut down, fill the soil profile, because that's the only reservoir you have. Start as early as possible, deficit irrigate, and then fill the profile. Start as early as possible and then irrigate a lot until you shut down. And there's no, wor there's no filling of the profile here because it's full the whole time. That's the idea. Uh, and so that's, so that's it. And there's probably other strategies that we can come up with. But to my mind, it seems like the thing that I would probably want to do is to wait. When you start, I would probably not irrigate very much, but sort of like nurse them along. And then as soon as the water is going to get shut off, I'd probably want to put the water on. I worked with a couple growers last year where we had probably a slightly longer. See, I don't know what we're going to get this year and how long, it, how long was it last year? About four to six weeks? What's that? July something? Yeah, July 20th. I think I might. It was the end of July. That I got yeah, yeah, yeah. And so that's what we were doing is, is we waited, waited, waited to start until the vines got a little bit stressed. So it kept the canopy size down. Um, 
then we were doing some deficit irrigation, deficit irrigation. As soon as the, they got the notice that the system was going to get shut down, uh, we figured out how much it would be to put on, I think it was half an inch at a time. Like how long was your irrigation set to put on half an inch at a time? Uh, and it depends on your uh, vineyard spacing and design and all that kind of stuff. And then I was like, yeah, just move through the blocks and put on half an inch, 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 because if the soil can only hold, you know, two to four inches of water, you know, you try and do your best to fill that up as much as you can. Um, going back to some other cultural practices that we're gonna have to be doing soon, shoot removal. Um, you know, you can be really aggressive with shoot removal this year, reduce leaf area, but you will reduce the crop load and maybe there's some sort of balance point there. Uh, as far as leaf removal, in this year, I wouldn't do any leaf removal if it was me, not even a little bit, because the vines are gonna get stressed and those basil leaves are gonna fall off. And I would hate to be in a situation where you pull the leaves off and then more leaves dry up and fall off. If we have a smoking hot like, year like last year. Well, that saved us actually last year. The smoke that came in at the end of August. Oh, oh. So, what, so, what, what, uh, so your suggestion, what was that? If we don't have a really hot year this year, then that could change the We had over 100 degrees in June. Yeah. Last year, we, last year we had a couple of 100 degree days by now. All right, I'm going to be honest. I think people pull way too many leaves anyways. Yeah, <laughs> I think people pull way too many leaves anyways. You only need a little bit of light on the fruit to get in there. Um, and I think that given what we can expect this year in terms of, you know, last year, Ochala, was it a bad pottery mildew year? No, uh, year before. No, but last year. It wasn't that no. Year. And so I don't know what we're going to get this year, but I think that the leaf removal thing is definitely one place, especially if you can expect less yield. Um, you know, reducing costs, input costs by not removing leaves and also not setting uh, oneself up for getting like fruit that gets completely fried. Uh, I th because I think that with the water deficits that might happen and now everyone's situation is different. What your soils are going to give you, um, how much your vines are going to grow. I think that's all different. It needs to be weighed. But I think that ultimately being really aggressive with leaf removal isn't going to change a whole lot of the, like pulling more leaves in the fruit zone isn't going to change the overall canopy demand for water. Um, but what it is going to do is going to expose that fruit and it's going to give you fewer leaves to dry up and fall off that might happen anyways. Yeah. Yeah. Are you assuming that people pull on the afternoon side? Or no, no. Because we've never had fruit burn pulling on the morning side. I've seen fruit burn on the morning side. We, we uh, I, I've never, I mean, we just pull right in the fruit zone with leaves and leaves above. Yeah. So as it gets to around 11 o'clock, it's shaded. Yeah. But we pull all the leaves in, in the fruit zone I, and leave leaves above it. It's, it's, it seems, and, and your situation, your experience, your experience is valuable. I think that, you know, when I consider the costs relative to how much is, you know, less yield that can be expected this year, mm -hmm. it, to me, I don't know if it pencils out, and, and, and that's, that's kind of what I'm thinking of. If you can expect lower yield, which I think you can, yeah. again, it depends on variety, block, and all that kind of stuff, and it sort of goes to Gordon's thing. It's like, where are you going to put all your resources? Are you going to farm everything the same, or are you going to put it into your money-making blocks? And everything else is just like, get through the year. Yeah, what, I just want to make one other comment, because you're talking about weight and then do deficit, but you know, basically, TID is waiting for us. Yeah. We have four weeks. Yeah. So the waiting, they're, that, they've done, right? I mean, you're not saying wait in addition to them, like hold off when we have four weeks. You're not. I am saying that. That we, we, we reduce it to three weeks or two weeks? Yeah. Uh, well, and that's why I said these different strategies. I mean, it's like, yeah, when, when start as early as possible is like when TID comes on, start irrigating. But then when you're irrigating, you're deficit <laughs> irrigating, right? And you might be deficit irrigating more than normal because you're really trying to, so this is actually not a bad strategy and what we've seen from our uh, most recent irrigation trial that actually the earlier that you start, the more yield you're gonna have. So it's kind of like, well, if you can expect lower yield anyways, maybe you do wanna start early to maximize your potential yield, but still irrigate at less amount. So a con to that last one there where you just start basically, you start early. Put the water on. So you build a huge canopy, and then later in the season when you don't have water, you have that high demand, your canopy is going to collapse. It could, and that's a risk. Right, that's that is a risk. When we we did this for five years. It starts to slowly, you know, desiccate from the top down. I mean, so so one thing you could do here is 
hedge is steps. you could hedge. I mean, you, we're talking about a big canopy here. Keep in mind, everyone is basically on VSP, which is a tightly hedged canopy. And I haven't said anything about hedging, but it's kind of like in all of these, when I say like fill the profile, fill the profile or keep the profile filled the whole time, it's like you better be out there with the hedger. Well, the, the flip side of that is for us, so you've got your vegetation that we're talking about, but what about the fruit? So if you start pounding water early, you blow those berries up, so that's going to leave you better off on the end. Right. You start to get shriveled and stuff. Right. So you could water the hell out of it. And that's, and that's what I was showing here, is that like, that's what I was showing here, is like, these vines that we put the water on early and then stress, like we cut it off, they were big vines and they look like hell at the end of the season. But here's the thing that we saw. We saw two things. We saw more yield every single year from those vines. We saw good quality at harvest, good enough quality. And we did not see a reduction in cluster numbers the following year. So when we waited, 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 and let them get super stressed early in the year, yeah, we had, you know, small berries or whatever and slightly more color, but the yield was way lower and we saw less yield in the following year because reduction in cluster number. So I'm not saying there's like a right way. I'm just saying that the vines are going to respond differently. I think that actually the notion of building this big canopy is a little bit, mis it's, it's not misleading, but it's a little bit like everyone's in a VSP and everyone's hedging. So how much bigger is that canopy really going to be if you, have, you can control it with a hedger? Right? Mm -hmm. Like you're going to grow it up into the wires, you can do all the wire lifting and all that kind of stuff. Shoot's going to get above the top, you're going to hedge it. You can maybe hedge it lower than you do normally, but what you've done by keeping the vines well watered uh, is you have more fruit. You, on your, the study you talked about, talked about last summer, we have the three sites in the valley. Yeah. Did you... Did you make some estimates about soil water capacity on those three sites just as a, an idea about how this valley compares to what you were talking about before the two to whatever inches. Uh, you know, at our three sites, it's like three inches at one site uh, in the top 100 centimeters. And then the other two sites are about five and a half of available water for the plants. So the, the, the one up north is three. Yeah, the one out in Eagle Point is about three inches. And those vines got stressed pretty early. Um, the one caveat, of course, is that like we may not make it to Verasian. We won't make it to Verasian if it's just in June. Um, and so there's kind of this balancing act of like, do you want to just go all in on making as small of a grapevine as possible, being aggressive on the shoot, uh, shoot removal, um, so you have just fewer shoots, which will also reduce a crop. Not your so it's like aggressive shoot removal, no irrigation or very little irrigation. And even if TID starts, you're not watering, right? And then you just let them get super stressed. And if you're really slick, you can have a pressure bomb or something to monitor how stressed they are. Start based on either that or visual cues. Then when you do start, be really sort of not a lot of water. And then when you do get the notice towards the end of June that they're gonna shut it off, do the best you can to fill the profile and, and just kind of limp towards the finish. That could be one approach.